Take your Bibles and go to James chapter 5. The epistle to James. The epistle of James, not to James. James chapter 5. This past Sunday, um, Phil Diaspera taught, and he taught on prayer. And thinking about what I wanted to share, I, I was reminded of this wonderful verse in James and the wonderful man of God that it talks about here. In James chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, Elias, and that's talking about Elijah in the Old Testament, um, just a different spelling. Elias, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. Elijah was a man subject to like passions. In other words, he was no different than you or I. He had his good days. He had his days that weren't perhaps so good. He had those feelings, those emotions that are common to all men. He dealt with life. He wasn't you know, somebody that was in somehow, some way different. And, you know, it's a point worth making because when I was a kid and I was taught about these men of God, these men in the Bible, like Elijah or the apostles or any of them, you know, literally, they always had in the books that, that I was given these halos around their heads. And... For a lot of people, whether they have that picture in their mind or not, they have that halo around the head of men that you read about in the Bible, as though somehow they were different, as though somehow they were just blessed in some way that made it easy for them or life was different for them, that they didn't have to work with their heart, with their minds, and so forth like we do, but that's not the case. Mm. He was a man with like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Three years and six months, he prayed earnestly, you know, fervently is, is another uh, text of that. He prayed that it would not rain for three years and six months. Now, this was not because he was a house painter and he just thought he'd get as much work done as he could without getting interrupted by the weather. This wasn't something that Elijah just took upon himself or decided that he didn't want to have any rain anymore. Um, this was something that God told him to do. He did this by revelation. You don't just decide on your own that you don't want it to rain for three years and six months and pray and, and you determine that. And in fact, when it comes to the weather, um, you know, unless you've got revelation, don't even bother praying uh, because you've got the painter who doesn't want it to rain, you've got the farmer that does want it to rain, and God can't accommodate everybody's individual need there, you know can't like, okay, it'll rain on Mike's house, but it won't rain on Jerry's house. And <laughs> Alan, you know, he, for some reason he likes snow, so we'll give him snow. It doesn't work that way. Now, on the other hand, things like, you know, a fierce storm, things like that. Yes, we can, you know, things that are obviously outside of God's will, we can pray about that kind of thing, but not just, you know, because we don't want it to rain. There was a good reason why this was all the case with Elijah, and we'll see it in a little bit here. And then it says in verse 18, And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. You can go to 1 Kings 16, and we're going to look at this record about Elijah and his praying and why all of this was the case. Why did God tell him to not have it rain for that long time, for three years and six months? And why then did he have him pray again that it would? In 1 Kings 16, we're going to get a little background to this event. What was going on in Israel at this time that God would have Elijah do this prayer? 
that God would have it so that it would not rain for three years and six months. Why? What was going on that that was the situation? Well, we find out in 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 29. And in the 30th and 8th year of Asa, king of Judah, begat Ahab, the son of Omri, to, to reign, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 20 and 2 years. So this is during that time when you have the divided kingdom. You have Israel and Judah. Israel being ten of the tribes, Judah being two tribes. And Judah being better off than Israel for most of that time. Israel <clears throat> when, was uh, pretty much from the beginning of that divided kingdom, was idolatrous, was against the will of God. But this king that comes along at this time, this king that begins to reign, Ahab, he was so bad that some of the other guys paled in comparison to him with his wickedness. Verse 31, And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of of Ithbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So it says as though the other guy wasn't bad enough, what Ahab does is really bad. And he goes and he marries Jezebel. Did you ever hear somebody say, well, she's a Jezebel? Well, this is, this is, where, this, this is where this comes from because this woman is just horrible. She is just terribly, terribly wicked, terribly wicked. And she influences him, Ahab, to be worse than any of the kings before him. She is not an Israelite. It says that she is from the Zidonians. She was the daughter of the king of the Zidonians, and she gets him to worship Baal. And, and Baal is the false god. Verse 32. And he, Ahab, <coughs> reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. So he builds a temple to this god Baal. And he builds an altar there in the temple to do sacrifices to him. And Ahab made a grove. A grove was this whole like area of, of different idols that they would go through. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that went before him. Wow. Now, if you read the history of Israel, like I say, they're all bad. They're, they're, all these kings are bad. And yet Ahab is so bad that, you know, he just he, he tops them all. Verse 34, in his days did Hio, the Bethlehemite, build Jericho and laid the foundation thereof in Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Sarah, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. So that's the background of what's going on in Israel and why Israel is so bad and why God goes to this great length to try to make a point to them, to get them to see that what they're doing is wrong and they need to come back to him. And this is all going to end up with this big showdown between Elijah, the prophet Elijah, and the prophets of Baal. Elijah was an incredible, incredible prophet. They're all wonderful, but Elijah's just the standard. If you're familiar with the, the record where it talks about the, uh, you know, it's called, most people refer to it as the Mount of Transfiguration. It's Moses yeah. and Elijah that appear to Jesus Christ in a vision. <clears throat> Elijah is just the standard, you know. Those, you, when you're reading the Gospels, you always catch wind of these guys that believed in reincarnation, and they're always looking if somebody, it was John the Baptist, Elijah, come again, and so forth. And... <clears throat> 
Elijah was this famous, wonderful prophet who did these incredible things. And, and beyond the miracles that he did, it's the stand that he takes, just this incredible stand in the face of such wickedness. 17, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain that these years, but according to my word. He tells him it's not going to rain, or you're not even going to have dew on the ground until I say so. Verse 2. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying to Elijah, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Because if it doesn't rain, things are not going to grow. And when things don't grow, you don't have food to eat. But somehow God still is going to take care of Elijah. You know, I once had somebody, um, there's a little poem. It's a nice little poem, but they were quoting it way out of context. The little poem goes, God has no hands but our hands with which to give them bread. He has no feet but our feet to walk amongst the almost dead, and so on and so forth. And they quoted this poem, making the and first of all, they quoted it as though it was scripture. I always like that when people quote a poem <laughs> and, and act like it's scripture. Okay? A poem's nice. It's not scripture. And they, they made the point that the only way that God has to bless people and take care of people is by our giving to them. That God needs to inspire us to give to them, and that's the only way God can, can meet their need. Well, giving's a good thing, and a lot of times, certainly, God will inspire someone to give to someone else, and that's, that's wonderful. But... My goodness, God is not limited to whether or not he can convince some stingy old guy to give to somebody else. He wouldn't tie his hands that way. Here he's got some birds, some ravens taking care of Elijah, so don't tell me God has no hands but our hands when it comes to that category. God will take care of our needs, whatever it takes, when we trust him. Here he does it with some ravens, and they just... I don't know how far they're traveling, but they're bringing him bread and just dropping it off for him to eat on a daily basis. Verse 5. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. So these ravens, they're not just bringing him a little, you know, some breadcrumbs, you know, they're I don't know what they're bringing, what, you know, what kind of meat they're bringing them, but they're bringing them meat, you know. Who knows what they were. <laughs> but they're bringing him food. They're bringing him food. Verse 7. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Even that doesn't last forever. And so Elijah now, he says, oh my gosh, the brook dried up. I haven't seen the ravens in a couple of days now. I, I, you know, God's no longer in business and I'm just up the creek that's dried up, I guess. No. Verse 8. No. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, see, if God, if one door closes, God's got another one here for, to take care of him. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So God's got a new plan. He tells him to go and I, I, I'd be embarrassed to tell you how many times I read this, and it never, I never caught it. I never caught it. Where is he telling him to go? Zidon. Who's from Zidon? Jezebel. Jezebel is from Zidon. So he's telling him to God. It just tickles me the way that God does this. He's telling him to go to Jezebel's land, and that there's some widow woman there in this terrible place that Jezebel came from who's going to take care of him. <laughs> and Elijah believes God that he's actually going to do this. Mm. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her 
and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. So God tells him there's going to be a widow woman that will take care of him in this place, and he goes there. Now, put your finger or a ribbon or something there and go to Luke chapter 4. We'll be back, but go to Luke chapter 4. What a wonderful woman this turns out to be. And again, this is a woman of Zion. This is not an Israelite. This is not even a believer. And, you know, I'd say you'd be hard-pressed to get a believer to, take, to do what he's going to ask her to do for him, but the fact was you would be hard-pressed to find a believer to do it. God had to send him to this woman to take care of him. And that's what Jesus Christ says in Luke chapter 4. Here, Jesus Christ is making a point to the Judeans who, you know, are all puffed up about, well, we're the ones that have the promises and so on and so forth. And in Luke 4, in verse 25, Jesus Christ says, But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months with great faith when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, which is the same as Zarep, it's just a different spelling again, a city of Sidon, or Zidon, unto a woman that was a widow. So Jesus Christ makes the point there wasn't anybody in, in Israel that he could have sent him to. It's a sad day when God's people are less believing God than the ones that are known to be worshiping Baal. But Israel has so turned their back on God that to take care of, of Elijah, he's got to send him out of there to the unbelievers. I'd like to read you a little bit um, more background about this. I think you'll enjoy. This is from um, Alfred Edersheim's Bible history. Edersheim is, um, again, a, one of these great 19th century scholars that is just to this day unparalleled in so many of these areas of history, Bible history. And let's see, I want to pick it up. Um, when in course of time the waters of Cherith failed owing to the long drought, Elijah was directed to go to Zarephath, where God had commanded for him even a more strange provisioner than the ravens, a poor, almost famishing widow, and she a Gentile. Here again, everything is significant. Sarepta was not only a heathen city outside the bounds of Israel, midway between Sidon and Tyre, but actually within the domains of Jezebel's father. The prophet who was not safe from Jezebel in Israel would be safe within Jezebel's own country. He for whom Ahab had so earnestly but vainly searched, not only throughout his own land but in all neighboring countries, would be secure, securely concealed in the land most hostile to Elijah's mission and most friendly to Ahab's purposes. But there are even deeper lessons it is only one of these that, cast out of his own country and by his own people, God can find a safe refuge for his servant in most unlikely circumstances. And then when faith seems to fail, where most we might have expected it, God will show that he has his own where least we should look for them. And he goes on. So, just very significant. Back to the record in Kings, 1 Kings 17. So he comes to this woman, and he asks her to get him a drink of water, in verse 11. And as she was going to fetch it, now, again, it would be enough to ask for a drink of water when it hasn't rained for three years and six months. Okay? Water's at quite a commodity at this point in time. But if that wasn't enough, he said to her, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread... <laughs> in thy hand. So not only does he have the nerve to ask for a drink of water, but 
he wants her to give him some food. Some food. And she said, Has the Lord thy God liveth? Isn't that great? Has the Lord thy God? She is not talking about the gods of her land. She's talking about his God. And she obviously recognizes and respects his God. As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. That's her plan. That's her plan. I'm down to the very last food that we have. I'm going to go home. I'm going to make it into a little meal, and we're going to eat it, and then we're just going to lay down and die. She is just given up. She's, she's in despair here. You know, what a terrible thing to be in that kind of circumstance. And yet he has the nerve, you know, to ask her to get him a meal because that's what God told him to do. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. Go ahead, you go home and, and, and do what you wanted to do, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. What nerve! <laughs> she just tells him, I'm going to go home in this little tiny, and he's going to say, well, that's fine, but feed me first. <laughs> would you have the nerve to say that to her? I don't know if I would. <laughs> Boy, it shows you how, how big Elijah believes God when he's, he's got the nerve to say that. I, I, and yet he says, fear not, fear not. Fear not, because he knows that God will take care of her. That God's not going to have her give him his last, her last food and that be the end of it. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, verse 14, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. Wow. There's a promise, huh? He, I don't know if Elijah even knew how long. He's never quoted three years and six months. He just says it won't rain until I tell you again. Okay, he's waiting. I, he doesn't know how long this is going to go on. But God told him that little bit of meal... And oil is going to last until it rains again. And every day they go there, and it's not like, I'm sure it's not, you know, that the barrel was like all of a sudden just overflowing. Every day it looked like, well, we, we got one more meal here. Well, we got one more meal here. And God just sees to it that it never runs out. You know, I've, I've been in situations in my life where things seem pretty tight where I didn't see great, you know, a big bank account, a lot of money in the bank, a lot that, oh, this will take care of me for my old age. You still don't see that. <laughs> <laughs> what I have always seen is that the barrel of meal doesn't run out and the cruise of oils never fail. I've, I've never gone and, and, you know, well, I can't eat today. That, that's never happened. That's never happened. God has always been faithful, and just like he was faithful to Elijah, he's always been faithful to us. Verse 15. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. What would have happened if she would have just said, no, I, I won't do that, I, I don't believe, who are you? You're, 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 not, you're not even one of my people. You're some guy from some other place. Why should I do that? You say you're going to do this, but, you know, talk's cheap. If she didn't believe him, she wouldn't have taken action on that. She wouldn't have done it. And if she hadn't, well, that would have been her last meal. But because she did according to the word of the Lord that he gave her, God took care of them. And that meal just kept lasting until it rained, until there was another source. Verse 17, And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Well, that's pretty sick, isn't it? Yeah. When you're so sick that there's no breath left in you, you know, they call that death. 
And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Why have you come? Why, why has this happened? My son's dead now. Is this why you came here? Verse 19. And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he knows that's not the case. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into, into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came unto him again, and he revived. Elijah raises this kid from the dead. He's dead. He's dead. And Elijah goes in there, and he ministers to him, does exactly what God tells him to do in that specific situation, and the child's raised from the dead. Verse 23, And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and the word of the Lord in, my, in thy mouth is truth. Mm -hmm. You know, just the <laughs> meal not failing every day wasn't quite enough to convince her. <laughs> You know, I don't think it's in that sense. If I doubted it before, it's just, you know, this is, you know, such great proof that you are a man of God, that you, that, that you walk with God in a great way. I think that's the essence of what she's saying there. That's Elijah, this wonderful Elijah, who, who you know, three years and six months, we'll begin, we won't go through the whole thing, but go to chapter 18. And it came to pass after many days, those many days were three years and six months, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. He tells him it's going to rain. Go find that wicked king Ahab. Talk to him. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab. Now, Ahab is a guy who is looking to kill him. Okay. Again, you just see Elijah's obedience moment by moment that God says, go show yourself to the guy who's been searching everywhere for you to kill you. And he does it. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was governor of the house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off all the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So you've got this great man, Obadiah, when Jezebel's trying to kill all the prophets, he goes and hides a hundred, 50 in one cave, 50 in another. <clears throat> and Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land, unto all the fountains of water, and unto all brooks, peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we may that we lose not all the beasts. So Ahab sends this guy, Obadiah, on a food-finding mission. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou my lord Elijah? And he answered, I am. Go tell thy lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldst deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? <laughs> he says, If I do that, he's, he's going to kill, you know, he's going to kill me. And he goes on to tell him that because when he comes to find you, you'll, you won't be here. I, I know you. You know, you'll God will have you go someplace else. But Elijah convinces him to, to show him. And that begins the great confrontation, the great showdown. And we'll read about that more next time.